Hi, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'm really pleased to be giving this update because I think the last uh, nine months or so has seen a dramatic change in the way we treat hepatitis uh, C. In this country, of course, uh, it is now a disease which can be effectively cured in almost all patients, and it can be treated with a short course of medicines, and hence ideally suited for treatment in primary care. So these are my uh, conflicts of interest. I don't need to remind you that this, is, this has been a silent epidemic uh, of the last century. We think that around 150 million people are infected and uh, around uh, uh, 250,000 in, in Australia and 50,000 in New Zealand. And, and that data is fairly robust on prevalence studies. And the number of people we see who die from hepatitis C, you can work out exactly what the overall uh, prevalence is in New Zealand. So we think about 50,000 people are living with hep C currently. Uh, a lot of um, the impetus to fund uh, better management of hepatitis C came about as part of Peter Hodgson's response to the bad blood debacle uh, with people being infected through transfusions. And you're well aware uh, that although the virus was discovered in 1989 and an antibody test found, made soon after that, uh, screening wasn't uh, introduced here until 1992. Hence, a number of people were infected uh, during that three-year period, and this led to uh, the government putting resources into hepatitis C. I should say, however, that transfusion-acquired hep C now is really an uncommon event. We still occasionally pick up uh, patients, mainly who have been transfused overseas. Uh, almost all the people we see now have been infected th through recreational drug use, mainly injecting drug use, uh, in their teens and 20s. Most of the people we see have been uh, clean for 20 or 30 years uh, and only uh, injected in their, as I said, in their teens and 20s. The peak time for this was, of course, the Woodstock era in the 1970s, but also the 1980s, and there's been a bit of resurgence uh, recently with the uh, increased uh, prevalence of, of uh, injecting meth uh, in New Zealand. We hear a lot about tattooing and body piercing as being a route for transmission. It's actually very rare and would only happen in those areas where uh, unsafe equipment is being used. So certainly tattooing in prisons uh, or tattooing in, in, in back streets of, of, of Asia could be associated with hep C infection, but not in licensed parlours. Um, mother to child, uh, a question you, you may be often asked, around 40% uh, of infected people are women uh, who are infected in their childbearing years. What's the risk of mother infecting uh, her baby? It's around 5%. So it's not nil. It's nowhere near as high as HIV or hep B. It's about 1 in 20. And it doesn't matter how the baby is delivered. And what we suggest to, to women, especially now that we have a universal cure, as I'll show you, um, we say, well, you can safely delay diagnosis until uh, the, certainly the baby has to be older than a year, otherwise you get false positive antibody results from the mother. Uh, but uh, you can even wait longer. The, the child never gets uh, significant uh, progression of disease as a child. And as I said, universal treatments will be available for if that child is infected. I should say uh, sexual transmission is not to thought to be a risk factor in uh, heterosexual uh, intercourse, but there has been a little uh, epidemic in every major city in the world over the last five years, and that has been in men who have sex with men with or without HIV co-infection. And that has been associated with uh, uh, a marked rise in hepatitis C infection, and that's certainly propagated by uh, this uh, feeling of, of safety with good HIV medicines and reduced use of uh, condoms in this population. So we are seeing a, a little epidemic. Certainly most of the acute hep C's we get referred to us now uh, are MSM uh, w without HIV. The questions, if you want to put up a, a billboard in, in your waiting room uh, and part of the, the ministry, we can talk about this later, is trying to encourage uh, community awareness in the community testing for hepatitis C, and you will hear a lot more about this over the next year or two. This is supposed to preempt 
the, avail the access to the new antivirals, but because of Pharmac's decision last year, we're actually chasing our tail a bit. We have wonderful treatments, but only uh, around 50% of people are diagnosed. These are the seven questions you should ask. Uh, the most important is the top one. Have you ever injected drugs a as a, uh, a young person or, or recently? And the others there are self-explanatory. Um, and these really are uh, what we encourage people to look at and decide that, uh, whether or not they're at risk for hepatitis C. Now, testing for hepatitis C, Arlo Upton was here earlier today, and Arlo said you must show this slide. This is one of Arlo's uh, presentations. She's given it a few GPCME meetings over the last year. And I think Arlo, who is medical director of LabTS <coughs> uh, Micro, has done a, a wonderful uh, uh, She's initiated a wonderful algorithm in the Auckland region in laboratory testing for you to know about. The three tests you need to know about are the antibody test. Uh, that just uh, measures your, the patient's response to the hep C. So if somebody's had hep C and either cleared it spontaneously or, or been cured with treatment, they remain antibody positive. But it's the right test to do as a screening test because it's cheap. And there are very few false positives. If it's positive and the patient doesn't have the virus, it means they've cleared it. So the antibody test should always be done first if somebody has one of those risk factors I showed you. The RNA test is a confirmatory test. It confirms active infection. This is more expensive. It's over $200. So we suggest that it shouldn't be used as a screening test. And the genotype just uses that RNA and decides what type of virus it is. And that's important because that tells us whether the person is, is eligible for the currently funded treatment, which is for genotype one only. Now, the genotype assay changed five years ago. It wasn't as accurate as it is now. So we say if someone has had a genotype test done within the last five years, you don't need to repeat it. It never changes. But if it's on the old assay, it's worthwhile repeating. Now, what lab tests are set up is what we call reflex testing. One of the big problems we've had, certainly in, in community alcohol and drug services and in the needle exchange programs, is when we ask somebody to have a blood test, they never come back for the follow-up for the next test to confirm. So Arlo set up this reflex testing. So you only have to request an antibody test. And if uh, lab tests show that it's positive, they will use that same sample of blood to send that off to the... Uh, Virology Lab, and, and in Auckland it goes to Lab Plus at, at Auckland Hospital, they will do the RNA test, PCR test. And if that's positive, then they will do the genotype test on that same sample. So it means if you have asked for uh, a hep C antibody test, as, and you can say risk for hep C screening, then you will get all three results back. And then you will know next time you see your patient whether that patient is a candidate for currently funded treatment or not. So I think that's been an enormous uh, advance in, in the way we can speed up diagnosis, speed up assessment, and certainly uh, try and avoid loss to follow-up. What are the genotypes? These are just different species of hep C. The most important thing to know is that genotype 1A and 1B are the only uh, types which currently have funded treatment from Pharmac. And this decision made last year, which became available in secondary care in July and for you to prescribe in October. So, but that's most of our patients. Around 55 to 60 percent of patients have genotype 1, either 1A or 1B. And the rest have other genotypes for which there's currently no funded treatment, oral treatment. And I'll talk what, what's available for those patients at the moment. We have wonderful data in New Zealand on, on newly diagnosed patients from the Hep C pilots run in Wellington and Bay of Plenty over the last three years. And they went out there, did saturated uh, public awareness, radios, newspapers, backs of buses, got a lot of people in, uh, found a thousand newly, new diagnoses, not newly infected, newly diagnoses. And you can see that the average age of diagnosis is between 45 and 55, which means that most people have already been infected for more than 20 years prior to presenting for diagnosis. Remember, this is a silent disease. You may know you had a risk factor in your youth, but you feel well or, or your symptoms are so non-specific, you never get a test. And so through uh, community testing, 
The average age we're picking people up is around 47 years old, so they've been infected for at least 20 to 25 years. And that's important because that means that many of them will already have significant liver damage by the time they're first diagnosed. Now, the pilots also uh, enabled us to look at that, and they used FibroScan, which has pretty much replaced liver biopsy. FibroScan is a, a very neat piece of uh, uh, technology where you use uh, shear wave elastography to measure stiffness of the liver, and it equates very well to the amount of fibrosis. So it's highly accurate for diagnosing the presence of severe fibrosis or cirrhosis. And if you look at those almost 1,000 new diagnoses in the pilots in Bay of Plenty and Wellington, you can see around a, uh, a quarter of them had severe fibrosis or cirrhosis. So 11% have cirrhosis. So you need to be aware that if you have a newly diagnosed person, a quarter of that they have a 25% chance of having severe fibrosis or cirrhosis. And these are the people who are going to get sick and die from their infection unless they receive treatment within the next five to 10 years. This really is a, a, a they're sitting on a time bomb, and we're beginning to see the results of that. Um, if you look at the, the, the graph on the left, th this represents people who have undergone transplant at our transplant unit in Auckland, we're doing about 60 a year, uh, plus the, the major sites uh, on the Eastern Seaboard of Australia. And the purple bars, or the crimson bars, represent the proportion being done for hep C. You can see over the last uh, couple of decades, hep C has become the primary cause for liver transplant for liver failure. About 40% of adults uh, who need transplants have it because of a hep C. The graph on the right is even more frightening. These are the numbers of people who develop liver cancer, which is almost always fatal within a year unless that patient can be transplanted. And the, again, the crimson bars reflect hepatitis C cases, and you can see that that's getting larger and larger and increasing by 20% per year. So for the first time last year, uh, more people developed liver cancer from hep C than from hep B, which is remarkable given that we live in a country in the Asia Pacific where we have endemic hep B infection. And this just reflects a large population, 50,000 people, who are getting older, what we call the aging cohort effect. So we're going to see more and more liver cancers. And we, we would estimate that by, uh, unless something happens within the next 15 years, we'll be seeing around uh, 1,000 liver cancers from hep C every year. We're currently seeing all in all around uh, 200 from hep C and about 400 overall. So it's going up rapidly. So it's going to get worse. This is what the current trend is, uh, based on very good uh, uh, modeling uh, analyses. And this is based on the only treatment will prevent all of these complications. It will get, prevent cirrhosis, prevent uh, death, prevent transplant. But the current treatments we have are pretty close to useless. These are the interferon injections once a week for a year. Uh, very few people start this treatment because of the terrible side effects. And days gone by, I've, I've stood here at your various meetings and talked about uh, how hard it is to get people through treatment. And even if people get through treatment, the cure rate is only uh, was less than 50%. But what if we have the new oral tr treatments which have been developed? Then it, you can see it has a dramatic effect on turning around the projected disease burden. And I'll come back to this at the end to show how hep C can be eliminated very soon, probably within 10 to 15 years in this country, given the current changes we're witnessing. Okay, what do we have for all oral treatments? This is the only all oral treatment which is currently funded in New Zealand. It's called Vicarapac. It's made by AbV. It, co it contains three different drugs which target three different steps of the hepatitis C life cycle. Uh, number one is the protease inhibitor. Number two is the, what we call the polymerase inhibitor. And number three is the NS5A inhibitor, which prevents uh, viral assembly and release. So it really targets a virus all the way through its building blocks. And it's important to combine different uh, molecules, as it is for HIV, because if you combine different molecules, you prevent resistance and you ensure that the, that the virus gets absolutely hammered uh, from three different aspects. So how does it work? This is really the data you need to know. This is um, uh, all the patients in, in, the, in what we call the phase three trials or the registration trials, over a thousand of them treated with this combination drug called Vicarapac plus ribavirin. 
And genotype 1A are in the uh, blue bars and genotype 1B in the green bars. And the, the different groups along the x-axis reflect whether the patients have previously been treated with interferon. Uh, and their response to it. And the two bars on, on the right are the treatment-naive patients. Now, this is got what the vast majority of patients you're going to see. So few patients have been treated in New Zealand with interferon that the, the three groups on the left really are of little relevance to us. It's only what's happening on the right, the patients who have never been treated before, the newly diagnosed patients. And you can see that the cure rates are extraordinary, 96% and 100%. And compare this to interferon, for, which for these genotypes had cure rates of between 25 and 35 percent. And uh, that was a year of treatment. This is 12 weeks of tablets. So really, really effective treatment. Um, you need to add ribavirin for patients who are genotype 1A. Vicuripac is the ABB combination. Ribavirin is a tablet you take twice a day. You were used to take it with interferon. It has actually been used for other viruses. It was tried in Zika uh, to, to treat that and various other viruses it's been tried to use. It's a non-specific antiviral. And you can see uh, on the right, uh, patients with genotype 1A, it makes a big difference if you add ribavirin to the mix. And it increases the cure rate by about 10%. In genotype 1B, it doesn't matter. You don't need ribavirin. And that's important. That's the one thing when you get your result, those reflex tests, it'll tell you whether the patient's eligible for bicuripac. Are they genotype 1? It'll also tell you whether they need ribavirin. Are they 1A or 1B? Overall, around 60% of New Zealanders with hep C have genotype 1. And of those, about three quarters are 1A and one quarter 1B. So you, you could see both of them in your practice. And these are, this is the label by MedSafe uh, and currently the recommendations by Pharmac. If you're genotype 1A, you get Vicaripac plus ribavirin for 12 weeks, this is all oral. Uh, if you're 1B, you get Vicaripac but no ribavirin for 12 weeks. So that's where the difference is. And that's how they come up in little boxes where you take three tablets in the morning uh, and one tablet at night, uh, shown in green, uh, whether or not you take the ribavirin. Prescribing and monitoring. To try and increase uh, general practice prescribing and prescribing by other community groups such as community alcohol and drug services, and we've now started uh, uh, outreach clinics in places like the Calder Centre at the City Mission, I'll come to later, and Needle Exchange. You need to have clear prescribing guidelines to give you the confidence and the information you need for assessing patients. We've provided a lot of those over the last year, both at the request of Pharmac and the Ministry of Health. And these are all uh, accessible uh, on your uh, desktop computer or on your mobile phone. These guidelines, and these guidelines were set up for secondary and primary care. So they talk a lot about treating cirrhotic and non-cirrhotic. We're only talking about treating patients without cirrhosis in primary care. But you can look at those. Uh, more importantly, you'll be familiar with the pathways. And Helen Lally, I don't think Helen's here. Helen was uh, largely responsible for this. Helen was part of our local DHB working party. And Helen uh, wrote these, and, and we all um, edited them. But these are a very uh, workable uh, documents for you to use for every step of treating your patient with hepatitis C. And finally, there's, uh, well, there's e-learning, and this really is a tool uh, for practice nurses as well as primary care physicians. You get, you, you get CME points, and it takes about 45 minutes to complete online. And this hasn't been as well uh, utilised as we thought since it, uh, this was finished. So the update was finished around September last year. There haven't been that many people enrolled. But we also, at the same time, we also had the BPAC because we were told by uh, your college that BPAC was a far more popular uh, resource to use. And so BPAC, uh, we wrote uh, uh, together with the Pharmac uh, this BPAC document. This contains the same information as the other documents, but in a much more uh, uh, usable, uh, printable document. And this has been hugely popular. There have been almost 6,000 downloads in primary care since this uh, was finalised uh, in October last year. So all of these will give you a step-by-step -step guide how to assess and treat somebody with hepatitis C. The most important assessment you have to do before you start somebody in primary care is work out whether they have cirrhosis, and this is the fibroscan. 
Now there's been uh, a marked increase in the numbers of fibre scans available throughout the country uh, as part of the Ministry of Health helping uh, some DHPs. Uh, XSCs, the Hepatitis Foundation, has also gifted many of their fibre scans to some of the uh, more isolated regions, Taranaki for example. And we now have, I think, six fibre scans in the Auckland region. We have one uh, at Green Lane, one at Auckland, one at Middlemore, North Shore. We also have a mobile one we use at East Street Needle Exchange, and another one we take around the prisons. And we have uh, free access to primary care to request fibre scans. And that's, you don't need a first specialist appointment. You're on the e-referrals, you push the fibre scan tab, and you should get a fibre scan uh, done on your patient within two weeks with the results sent back to you. <coughs> no, it's through the um, gastro departments or for us through the liver unit. Yeah, in fact, you don't. You just do it on the e-referrals portal. I think the e-referrals portal or the hepatitis referral forms are on the gastro pathway, even though it comes to the, the liver unit. That, that's how you enter that. And uh, I'll, I'll grade them. And, but we try and have a turnaround within two weeks. We also take the machines to, to the various alcohol and drug services uh, and various other community areas, such as uh, the quarter centre. And it's very simple. It tells you a score, how severe that patient's scarring is. And the nurse or whoever's uh, doing the exam will tell you whether the patient has cirrhosis or not. And if the patient has cirrhosis, then the patient should be sent to primary care because they need follow-up. Even after they're cured of their hep C, they need regular surveillance for liver cancer. And at this time, it's difficult to arrange that within primary care. There are some other tests you should do, and some of these are recently added to the label on the MedSafe website. There's good evidence that hepatitis C causes diabetes, hepatitis C causes insulin resistance. If you actually suppress and then eradicate hep C to somebody who's on insulin, you'll find that their insulin requirements will go down pretty rapidly, which is obviously a good thing, but you need to be aware that many patients who are insulin-dependent diabetics, you'll need to follow their uh, sugars and they may well need to reduce their insulin uh, during and after successful antiviral therapy. Anemia is a problem when people are on ribavirin. It's not a huge problem, but I'll speak to that in a minute. Um, a couple of other things, HIV, hep co-infection, slightly more uh, complicated, and these patients need to come to uh, our hospital clinic. But the numbers of people with co-infections in this country are tiny. Of the hep C population, about 1% have uh, hep B as well, and are mainly Asian patients who are infected with both viruses in their countries of origin. HIV co-infection with hep C is, again, incredibly rare, uh, and most of the co-infected patients we see have acute hep C, and they subsequently clear it. So those two are, are, are very, very rare. The most important con contraindications of Vicaripac are people who have advanced disease, uh, but they won't be coming to you anyway. Uh, people who are on drugs which can uh, interact, and I'll spend a bit of time talking about that uh, shortly, drugs which interact with Vicaripac. Uh, but the major contra contraindications uh, are those to ribavirin, which your genotype 1A patients require. So remember, three quarters of your genotype 1 patients are 1A, and you'll get that in the result from the uh, reflex testing from lab tests. Ribavirin is a drug which uh, is teratogenic, and we used to say in the old days when we were using interferon and ribavirin, uh, and women that they shouldn't become pregnant, that men shouldn't conceive whilst they're on ribavirin because it is incorporated in, in the sperm. So contraindications for ribavirin is pregnancy. Uh, other contraindications are ribavirin because it can cause anemia, people with unstable angina or people with thalassemia. And it's mainly uh, thalassemia major. We've certainly treated plenty of thalassemia minors, but you just have to be careful uh, and dose reduce as, as required. But there are not terribly many contraindications to Vicaripac, and certainly in primary care, there should be very few, other than potential drug-drug interactions, which I'll spend a bit of time on in a minute. Okay, coming back to women of childbearing potential. And this is, not an, uh, this is probably about 10, 15% of all the people living with hep C in New Zealand are still uh, a woman and still in their childbearing ages. I've mentioned that uh, pregnancy is contraindicated while you're on ribavirin because of the teratogen. Same reason for breastfeeding is also contraindicated. And 
also it can cause anemia in, in, in the breastfed infant. Contraceptives, you have to choose what contraceptive you use in women of childbearing potential. Uh, ethanol estradiol does inter interact with this uh, particular medicine and it can cause liver to toxicity. So unfortunately, women who are on the combined OC containing uh, ethanol estradiol need to change to either um, a progesterone-only pill or to barrier contraception for the duration of treatment, which is 12 weeks. Yep. And we, all, we would tend routinely in women of childbearing potential to uh, check uh, a pregnancy test before we embark on treatment. Okay, this is a form. Uh, so the ministry uh, are encouraging a community-based targeted testing and assessment program so that your patients come in and ask to be tested and you can organise reflex testing. Pharmac are encouraging a community-based treatment program, and we'll talk about some of the hurdles you face, I know, uh, uh, getting that uh, going, but we have seen that, that this has started to, to really uh, spread uh, since the 1st of October. And to request uh, Vicarapac, you have a form which you can download from the Pharmac site, and you have to fill it in and send it off. It's a very, very simple form. You do need to provide evidence that the patient has hepatitis C, and you have to provide the genotype, because it won't work for other genotypes, so it's for genotype one. Uh, you should provide whether the patient has cirrhosis or not, based on the fibre scan, and uh, we're certainly now getting plenty of refer uh, referrals for fibre scans saying, I have a patient I want to start treatment on, but I want to know whether they're cirrhotic or not. And those patients, as I said, will get that patient in and back to you within two weeks. And then you need to know the potential drug-drug interactions. And what Pharmac has set up with AbbVie, uh, the pharmaceutical company who make this drug, is a system where the local community pharmacies uh, will provide a safety net and go through all the patient's concomitant meds for you to make sure there's no significant drug-drug interactions. But also there are other resources specifically for that I'll, I'll, I'll talk to in a minute. This is a very easy drug to use in the patients who don't have cirrhosis. Monitoring on treatment is very, very simple. How often do you need to see the patient? And this is one question which has been asked repeatedly until we can find a way to fund specifically a course of treatment, which is coming, I should say. Safety monitoring during treatment can be limited depending on whether the patient's genotype 1A and needing ribavirin or the patient does not have ribavirin. If the patient is genotype 1A, they need a full blood count done at week 2, week 4 and week 8. So they need a blood count done. They don't need to come back, but they need a form to get the blood test done. And they need somebody, uh, a practice nurse or, or, or a general uh, a practitioner, or even liaising with the nurses at the hospital to check those results. Because in around 8% of cases, that's 8% only, you may need to reduce the dose of ribavirin. Patients with genotype 1B need no monitoring whatsoever during treatment because they're not on ribavirin. And this is a very safe population. There's no risk of liver toxicity if you don't have cirrhosis. And you shouldn't test the virus during treatment. There's no point. It doesn't matter when the virus becomes negative. Almost everybody is undetectable by four weeks, but it doesn't matter. The only repeat test you have to do is 12 weeks after they finish treatment. So 20, it's called week 24, but it's 12 weeks after the person finishes treatment. That's called sustained virological response 12, or SVR 12, and that will say whether or not the person's cured. And in 98, 99% of cases, that will be in fact the case that they'll be cured. So this is the algorithm for patients you see with hepatitis C. So you're going to test them with the reflex testing. You're told that they're RNA positive. You're going to do a fibre scan to see whether they have cirrhosis or not. If they have cirrhosis, they should be referred to secondary care, where they'll need long-term follow-up. If they don't have cirrhosis, then these are patients you could potentially treat in your practice, uh, and we would encourage you certainly to discuss with the local clinic if, if you want support on that. Um, if they're genotype 1, they already have Pharmac-funded treatment from the 1st of October. That has a high cure rate, and those patients don't need any further follow-up. If they're negative 12 weeks after they finish treatment, they can forget about their hep C. It will never come back. If, what, what if, though, if they're the 40% or so who don't have genotype 1? They have genotype 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. 
Those patients, there's currently no funded oral treatment by Pharmac, and we suggest that they have an annual review. And I would certainly hope that we're going to have treatment for those patients before the end of this year. I'm being an optimist, but I certainly know that Pharmac are very keen to get the new pangenotypic treatments across the line as soon as possible. But there is currently another route for them to access treatment. There are some pangenotypic treatments available overseas, and patients can uh, self-fund and self-import generic direct-acting antivirals, and they may ask you about that. Um, and these do work. Uh, there's instructions uh, how you do this on all those documents I showed. The BPAC document has a step-by-step -step how you access that. It is allowed by MedSafe. They, they're not allowed to say they encourage it, but it is allowed by MedSafe and by Pharmac, and they were involved in, in helping write the guidelines for this. What is the cost to the patient? It's around $2,000 to $2,500, depending on what they use. And you can see the cure rates down there in that bar graph, SVR12 is a cure. Uh, for different genotypes, it's, it's, it's similar to what's reported in, in the registration studies. So these drugs do work if you get them through a legitimate uh, website. And the only legitimate website I would advise patients to access is something called the Fix Hep C Buyers Club. You may have heard quite a lot about this last year through Hazel Heald uh, and through the Otago Daily Times and subsequently going public on the national program. So this is run by an Australian, uh, uh, really uh, altruistic physician who spends his life now helping people access treatment when they can't afford it or it's not funded in their countries. And it's imported from licensed generic companies who make it under license to the bid manufacturers, usually in Hyderabad, but in one of the two big Indian cities where all the generics are made. And it's, this is a step-by-step -step, uh, way where patients can access this, and this is also available for the patients to do it, and then they come to uh, you or to us asking for a prescription. And how many patients are doing this? Well, it's not a huge number, because not uh, all of our patients can afford that, even though it's 2,000 or 2,500. For many patients, that's beyond their means. Uh, it's changing. Uh, before July 2016, it was people were mainly genotype 1. But since Ju uh, July 2016, as you'd expect, because genotype 1 patients get free treatment from Pharmac, uh, the numbers have gone down and they're largely genotypes three, two, th 2 and 3. So we've had about 260 patients have, have funded generics already from this country. I think it's second best. We want Pharmac to fund these new drugs. The new drugs are much better than these drugs, uh, but they, don't, uh, they, they haven't yet uh, agreed to do that, but we hope that they are going to do that by the end of the year, in which case we don't have to uh, encourage our patients to look elsewhere to import their own drugs. But it is available. What is on the horizon? And these are the new treatments. So these, these treatments here I've shown you, uh, Daxof, uh, Velsof, these are uh, the first generation pangenotypic drugs, cure rates of around 90%. I'll show you what's on really on the table for Pharmac to assess. There are two uh, combinations which are really what we term perfectivir. They really are fantastically successful. The first is Gileads, combining two drugs called Sofosbuvir and Valpatisvir, a polymerase inhibitor, and one of these NS5A inhibitors. And this is just a cure rate, so you can see across the genotypes, around 97 to 100%. So already, uh, this uh, combination is approved by the FDA and in Europe. And it's uh, approved by MedSafe. It's just not yet funded by Pharmac. There's another drug which is equally as good, uh, and this is the AbbVie fixed dose combination. This is a protease inhibitor and an NS5A inhibitor. And again, the cure rates are just extraordinary. And only eight weeks is required for non cirrhotic patients, so even better than that previous combination. You have a, a tablets once a day for eight weeks will cure uh, 98 to 90 percent of patients. This has the advantage that there's no drug interactions. Okay. And this is awaiting approval. So these two combinations are what we're hoping Pharmac will fund within the next 12 months. And then this really is uh, game on for community prescribing. And this is where we are uh, at, um, uh, at uh, cure rates of around close to 100%. Drug-drug interactions are the one thing you need to know. So drug-drug interactions, they are important, and it's important because this combination of drugs, Vicuripac, contains a drug called ritonavir. And those of you who have looked after HIV patients know that ritonavir is a really potent uh, inhibitor of the CYP3A4 metabolic pathway. 
And so this is the most important drug in the combination in terms of uh, causing drug-drug uh, uh, interaction. So just to look at bold, all patients need a careful medicines review before they start treatment. Uh, some drugs are contraindicated. Uh, and can be stopped for 12 weeks. If, if the patient's on a statin, for example, there's no harm in stopping that for 12 weeks. Other patients who are on complicated uh, antipsychotics or anti-epileptics, they need to change to an alternative drug which may be safe for the duration of therapy. And I pointed out that the median age now of diagnosis is 45 to 55 years. And we now know that this is the same age group who are getting all the comorbidities associated with metabolic syndrome, obesity, diabetes in our community. So there are uh, some more common drugs than others we have to think about when looking at Bicurapac, and these are the cardiovascular drugs in particular. Um, there's plenty of resource for you to use. All of those uh, resources I showed you, BPAC, the pathways, click on to these resources. And, uh, Abbey have their own, there's MedSafe have their data sheet which is online. Abbey have their medical information down the bottom which can either be at the end of the phone or this new uh, fold out which they've just supplied which has all the important New Zealand drugs. But the one I use and the one I think uh, the nurses enjoy using the most is the University of Web Liverpool website. This is a fantastic resource set up uh, in this pharmacology department used the world over. Uh, for determining whether the person's concomitant medications are safe to use or must be stopped. And this can be on your phone, your tablet, your desktop. It looks like this, uh, and it's, it's very, very nice. You click on whether the patient's on Vicurapac or not, and then you, look at, you put in the drug they're on. Important drug may be methadone. About 20% of our patients are on methadone. And it will print out on, on the uh, right lower corner uh, what the bottom line is. There's actually no uh, contraindication with using methadone. It's a green, so it's traffic light, green, orange, red. Uh, green, happy to continue, don't have to change your dose. Orange uh, is a drug like um, Zopoclone. Zopoclone, the uh, exposure doubles of Zopoclone, so you just have to reduce the dose. The person can continue the Zopoclone, but they have to reduce the dose. And then you may have drugs which are red, Diazepam is red and so are the statins. It's easy for the statins. They just stop for the duration of 12 weeks uh, and then they restart. But for a drug of a person's uh, on uh, benzodiazepines and you have to somehow try and either significantly reduce the dose of that person's or switch them to a drug such as Zopoclone. But this will print out, not only will it print out what that particular drug uh, will interact with Vicuripac, but it also will print out a list of drugs of the same class which you can switch the patient to, which are perfectly safe. This really is a, a fantastic uh, interactive uh, website to use, and you'll get within just a few minutes exactly which drugs that person has to stop, uh, which drugs that person needs to switch to uh, for the duration of the 12 weeks Vicera pack. So just to finish, really, to talk about Vicera. So Vicera pack is the only funded drug. It is funded for primary care. It's extremely effective. Um, you will, if you uh, take this on and you treat patients, almost all of your patients will be cured uh, within 12 weeks of therapy. It has a very low rate of what we call virologic failure. That's patients developing resistance, and that's because of the way it's designed. And I should point out that it has a very low rate of patient discontinuation because it is so well tolerated. In the bad old days of interferon, about 15 to 20% of our patients used to stop treatment because of just unresolvable depression or weight loss or itch or skin rashes. The discontinuation rate, both in the clinical trials and the real world, is less than 1% for Vicuripac. So it's very, very well tolerated. And this really has had a dramatic effect on treatment uptake. These are figures from Pharmac, and it shows you the numbers of people being treated each year from Pharmac-funded treatment. You can see that given you've got 50,000 people infected in this country, with 1,000 new infections a year through injecting drug use, the numbers are really pathetic. Uh, until July 2016, which is when Pharmac funded Vicarapac for secondary care, and then October in primary care. And that has led to a 20-fold increase in treatment uptake. And we expect in the first year, uh, by July this year, well over 3,000 people would have been treated and cured of their hepatitis C. 
and we expect that number to go up to 5,000 a year when Pharmac bring in the, what we call the pangenotypic drugs, which you can use to treat everybody, not just the genotype ones. So this is a phenomenal change in just a few months, and it really is beyond what we thought would happen. I should point out that it is happening largely due uh, to the efforts of many of you in the room and around the country. We are now treating 10, we, we're looking at treating 10% per annum in the next year or so. A third of the patients of those first 1,500 have been treated in primary care by general practitioners. In Auckland, Northland and the Bay of Plenty, uh, due to specific uh, initiatives there, it's over uh, th two thirds of patients are being treated in primary care. We're treating virtually no non-serotic patients in secondary care anymore. We asked them whether they want to be treated by us or go back to their GPs, and every one of them to date has said, I want to go back to my GP for treatment. Um, we have also pushed this beyond uh, uh, general practice. We want uh, what we call treatment as prevention. We want to prevent those 1,000 new infections per year, which is all happening in the injecting drug use population. And we've been helped by our, our colleagues in Sydney and Melbourne who have run these clinics for years. So we have set up a clinic in the city mission, and that's now run by the doctors here doing a phenomenal job uh, treating patients, including homeless patients with Vicaripac. We have a very active treatment program now in the E Street Needle Exchange, which has uh, many, many hundred current injectors, and we're just kicking off uh, treatment programs in AOTS and CADS, and we have an ongoing program in the prisons around Auckland. It is going to make a difference. This is what we expect to see with a current interferon treatment in an aging population. But using very robust modelling, we think that we can uh, eradicate hepatitis C, certainly by 2035 within this country, but it will need uh, all of you in the room to take this on. And I know that there, people do have some uh, questions about how they fund this, how they fund treating patients, and I'm happy to talk to that now and talk to what I think is going to happen in the next few months to certainly facilitate uh, you being able to treat patients in your own practices. Thank you. Well, wow, thank you. So we've got about nine minutes, eight, eight nine minutes for some questions. Uh, we've got a roaming microphone. Please put your hand up to the mic. The mic's over there. So we've got one. Any more questions at the moment? No. Um, hi, Ed. I treated one patient early on, and I was quite confused, and I think maybe that's been sorted out with the mechanism of it, because um, I didn't know, and the chemist next door isn't one of the chemists that is licensed, and you get it actually from the company, not a chemist, and that was confusing. Right. Uh, they've tried to simplify this. It's different from any other. It's not a special authority. It's, it's a different way to access the drug. Uh, and initially, there were very few uh, pharmacies around uh, uh, the country who were able to, to dispense. I think there were, there were only uh, less than 20, but now that number has proliferated and I think there's certainly more than 50 or 60 pharmacies around the country, including a large number in the Auckland region. But it was a problem, uh, certainly uh, in the last quarter of last year, the number of pharmacies who were registered to dispense this. I think now there should be a pharmacy in every, uh, if not in every suburb, certainly in every region of, of, of Greater Auckland who can dispense. We've even got pharmacies, for example, in, in the city mission now accredited to dispense. So, so Abby have done a, a job of really uh, training the pharmacists. They do, the pharmacists are fund, funded to do this, so they want to do it. Um, and uh, so uh, what happens is you fill in the form, you send it off, you nominate a pharmacy, so you need to know which pharmacies are approved. I think Abby have a list of all the approved pharmacies and they're happy to provide that list. Um, and then uh, that medicine will be delivered to the pharmacy. It can be delivered to the general practitioner. It can be delivered to the patient at his or her home. Uh, we prefer to the pharmacy, so the pharmacy can go over the drug-drug interactions. Now, does someone from AbbVie want to talk to that? Is... Yeah, Dave. Uh, we've got about, yeah, 230 pharmacies now around the country. So any pharmacy can come on board. They just need to complete some training prior. Um, but, yeah, if you've got a pharmacy next door or nearby, just ask us. We can approach them and do some training with them and get them on board um, as soon as possible. But um, hopefully, yeah, there's, there's plenty around Auckland now, so that shouldn't be an issue.
Yeah, just give us a call and we can go and speak to the pharmacy, get them on board. And if you look on our website or Pharmax website, it's got the list of the current pharmacies, which is vicira.co.nz. So how many of those pharmacies will be within the Auckland metropolitan region? Oh, well over 100, about 120, I think, are in right, Auckland. Okay, yeah. Yep. Any so. other questions? No. So shall I speak? So, so, so in terms of if you haven't treated anyone, I'd encourage you to look at the guidelines. Uh, the numbers of visits you'd have to do to get a person through treatment, the minimum number are two. One is your assessment, obviously to go over the patient, make sure the patient's eligible, uh, checking the drug-drug interactions, although the pharmacy will also go through that. Then a second uh, to initiate treatment, although that can be done by the practice nurse. And then there needs to be a follow-up uh, uh, appointment at 12 weeks post treatment or at least a follow-up blood test and communication to see if the person is cured. Uh, we are looking at an initiative certainly within the northern region which are um, counties Manukau, Auckland, uh, Waitemata and Northland. We're looking at trying to uh, instigate an initiative to help provide a, a, a small uh, upfront payment for patients who are going to be treated in primary care. That's currently under negotiation but we expect to have that finalised within the next three months. Just a bit of, what, can we get the mic, please? Again, please uh, say your name just for the record here. Uh, Richard Powell here again, Three Kings. Um, just thinking about identifying these patients, if um, MBV could get MedTech to write a little query program that looks th through our list of diagnoses of Hep C or go through the lab and they can tell us, you know, these three patients have hep C, you might think about bringing them in to, to screen them and see what genotype they are. Yes, uh, the, the, the ministry has, has uh, a representative from the College on it, Carol Atmore, who many of you will know. So Carol has, has developed such a tool uh, for trying to find patients in your practice who have hepatitis C, and I thought that was going to be disseminated through the college. Um, Certainly, I know that Neil Hefford at Graylin has also developed his own medtech search for that. No, we think that's, that is important. For that, on Hep C, you'll need to know what you're searching for because a lot of people are just put down as viral hepatitis because it's really hard to find the code for hepatitis C. If you type hepatitis, it says viral. If you type hepatitis C, you get the coding for it. So if you're searching, you need to search on hepatitis, viral hepatitis as well, because a lot of people will be miscoded. I should point out, though, still around half the people with hep C in our community are undiagnosed. But most of them know of uh, their previous risk behaviour. Most of them know of members of their peer group uh, when they were young who have actually developed complications from their hep C. So most of the new diagnoses we see are people who say, well, I got tested because a friend of mine is just been transplanted or a friend of mine developed uh, a liver cancer. But we, we think it's around 50% because still, in 2016, almost 50% of the people we see uh, with liver cancer from hep C, and the, this is around, uh, as I showed you, over 100 people a year now, almost 50% of them, they developed the liver cancer before their hep C is diagnosed. So that's a very, I think, good, unfortunate surrogate marker of the undiagnosed population. Perhaps just uh, David Bratt from uh, Work and Income, actually. So two things, really. One, to uh, follow up, which you didn't mention, which the issue of people who've been in prison who may have started their treatment in prison, yep. because corrections have been very careful. So uh, do try and facilitate that. Uh, two, the reverse, of course. <laughs> people who started and then go into prison, though, we expect the corrections to do that. Yeah, we certainly, corrections are uh, happy for us to set up treatment programs with, with their medical clinics in prison. We have a particular issue with uh, uh, Mount Eden because it's a remand prison and the length of stay certainly was never long enough to treat people with 48 weeks of the interferon, but now it's only 12 weeks. We are actually treating people and we're making sure that uh, when Bridget goes into the clinic, our nurse specialist, if, if somebody starts on treatment, we make sure that when they're discharged, we know where they go. Yeah. Uh, but certainly corrections are supportive. What we would like, though, is we would like a, a screening program 
in prisons. And that, that as you know, uh, depends on which prison you're looking at. They have different uh, protocols uh, for different prisons. And they're all by, they're all voluntary too. That's yeah, right. They, they don't, That's right. I, I was it, amazed about that. The other thing is, uh, if they are low income, they would be eligible for a disability allowance to help offset the cost of attending the doctor. Now that, that's new, isn't it? I heard from the ministry that so WINS we're, will we're provide. In we're in the process of trying right. To so get that's being set up, but there will be a for for patients who are who are on a benefit. Uh, not just not just benefit. Disability allowance is income related. Yes. So anybody who would qualify for a community service card would be eligible for a disability allowance. And when do you think that will become? Well, effectively, it would happen now, but what okay. we're trying to do is create it so that the payment is made in larger amounts in a shorter time. So, yeah, it's, uh, it isn't quite in place, but it's getting there. Great, thanks. I've got one question here and then the last one over there. Hi. Uh, I would like to know uh, about alcohol and drug abuse and the use of medicine or this therapy. Alcohol and drug use. Well, I think. Drug use is certainly, um, you have to think about uh, is somebody going to turn up for, to take their medications? And I think they're not contraindications, but they make, you have to decide, is that person, first of all, is that person, uh, is that the primary uh, health issue? Is it the hepatitis C or is there ongoing uh, substance abuse? But having said that, for people who are still injecting, this is a high priority population to treat because if we treat them, we will turn off infection. And I think they've already shown that in a little pilot in central Melbourne. If you treat, you only have to treat about 20 or 30 percent of the actual uh, current injecting drug use population. You stop, you can stop new infections in that city. So we have to target people who are currently injecting, and that's the main reason why we have set up these outreach clinics and the needle exchanges. Uh, does it reduce uh, the efficacy of treatment? No. There have been some very good studies done over the last couple of years, and we've been involved in a couple of them, where we have targeted and treated uh, current injecting drug users with the same medications uh, as in uh, a population who are not injecting, and the cure rates are the same. Your next question is, what about reinfection rate? In fact, the reinfection rates have been very low uh, in the injecting drug use population. I think it's because people engage with treatment tend to engage with harm reduction. Uh, use more needle exchange, uh, use more opioid substitution. Alcohol? Alcohol is different. I think if, if somebody is, uh, is continuing to drink very, very heavily, then actually getting rid of the hepatitis C may not prevent progression of their liver disease. So I think uh, one of the uh, things we try and do uh, is uh, modify their drinking behaviour, refer those people to community al alcohol and drug services to try and reduce their alcohol consumption. It doesn't prevent the treatment from working, but it just may cause progression of the liver disease despite curing the hep C. Okay, thank you. Would you advise to um, yeah, wean them off the alcohol first and then start treatment, or would you uh, advise to start treatment? And well, I, th I think it depends on the amount of alcohol someone's drinking. If someone is, is a hazardous drinker or, or drinking heavily and has, alcoholic, uh, has alcoholism and and consequences thereof, then that's their most important health problem, and I would address that first. Yep. And there's one other. Yep, one last. Um, thank you for a great talk, Ed. It's been fantastic. It's been a bit of a scary topic, and it's become really clear. My question was about relapse and how often we need to manage them, and if there is a pattern of relapse, is it in the first five years or ten years? Or relapse from an, uh, Vicuripac or yep. injecting? Yep. Vicuripac. Infection relapse. The infection relapse overall is going to be around 2 to 3 percent. Uh, across all the studies of Vicera PAC, it's around 2 to 3 percent. Of those patients, and if we're treating 3,500 people a year, which we're going to be doing, we expect to see about 80 or 90 people a year uh, with relapse, with resistance. The good news is those two pangenotypic regimens I showed you, they can be used to retreat those patients. So those next generation tablets are perfect for retreating Vicaripac relapses. So at the same time, we have treatment available to treat genotype 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 later this year. We'll also have a treatment which will work to treat anyone who relapses after Vicaripac. Or you only need to check, so, so if somebody is, is negative at 12 weeks, you don't need to monitor them again. 
the chance of relapsing uh, later than 12 weeks after treatment is finished is something like 0.001%. It's tiny. Okay, you don't you. need to. Th thank you for that, uh, Dr. Dan. The, um, a very interesting uh, conversation that's created here. I think you laid the challenge to us, the general practitioners. It's quite inspirational, the goal of uh, eradicating um, hepatitis C, but also doable uh, with the collaboration, cooperation of the whole sector. So uh, on that note, thank you very much for your interesting talk.